So um, this presentation, the Mayan, what they do when they move into the future is first they say, let's stand in the past. What have the ancients taught us? What have the indigenous people taught us? Bring that forward into the future and then keep bringing everything forward in, into the future. So thank you so much for a, a prelude to my presentation. Uh, Oh, I got to go to the slideshow. The Zoom slideshow? Yeah, so that's the, the uh, painting of my book by uh, Su uh, Sudira in um, Ananakanan. It expresses the feeling of our watershed. It's such a deep thing to us. We're so much a part of us. And um, I've come to different real realizations while I'm writing this book that I never thought I would when I first had the idea. I knew that watersheds were really important and they had been important to, to past civilizations, but I didn't, but I'm gonna convince you that they are the fundamental fabric on planet Earth, the fabric of, of everything. And uh, a realization I came to just a couple of weeks ago is that, well, you know, people say, okay, that's nice, plant trees and uh, put ponds and things like that, but that's going to take 50 years to change anything, right? People say that. So, and then they say, if you're going to try to plant trees, you're going to have to wait like 50 years. But I'm here to tell you, and my PowerPoint presentation will tell you that we can do it right now, right away. We can change the planet, the ecological systems and rebuild um, sustainability right away. Okay, this is strange. Um, should I join audio? Join audio? Okay. All right. Yeah, so my premise to the talk is that we, well, it's happening right now. It's happening all over the planet. We can reverse all the dynamics of climate change for thousands of years in the future uh -huh, by following basic ecological principles. A lot of technology we're looking at today, you know, has failures and we have to change it. That's great. I support all those technologies. But the one thing we can really rely on are civilizations that have lasted thousands of years already, right? And nurture their water set and have a, an abundant life and a very happy life. Uh, and that I've researched and studied a lot about how much time it takes to regenerate a, a rainforest. And the, I'm very firm in the statement that the ecology of the earth can be completely regenerated within five to 25 years. And Ramesh told me something really amazing uh, the other day that people say that if we leave the oceans away uh, the way they are, they'll completely be generated in 10 years. So when we're predicting, you know, how much carbon to, to soak up, how much the solar energy to do, we've got something really fundamental that guarantees itself. Okay, no questions until I'm done, all right? I appreciate just listening and then, then we could talk when I'm done. So this is a color-coded map by a friend of mine, Robert Scuzz, uh, showing all the watersheds of the United States. And he's done that for the whole planet. So um, you can even see where you are here. You can see where North Carolina, where you live, where you just come from, and it's all part of one big watershed. It is the most fundamental thing we have on planet Earth, both above water and underwater. Okay, this uh, green painting on the bottom right is one watershed. And if you think of where you live, you're definitely part of a watershed. It's impossible to find anything that's not part of a watershed. And um, it all has the fundamental same flow. If we want to create a resilient watershed, every watershed on the planet has the same vibrant flow. It's not going to change. At the top are old growth forests. We already know how incredibly they're important for carbon capture and the water and the, and the species to keep alive and the minerals that are in the, in the water. Um, and then valleys form and we have, you know, agriculture and 
early human human civilization. And then we go to the delta phase that Baba talks about. Remember the mountain, valley, and civilization? So that's what we all, you know, and when I started doing this, I realized most of us don't realize we're in the watershed at all. And it should be the opposite. I mean, for all of our evolution, for millions of years, actually there's an example of a watershed 1.25 million years ago in Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, this shows a small watershed. So human beings have been, been adapted and thriving in, in watershed an awfully long time. It's only very recently that this story has been taken from us that we, we think about cities, we think of buildings and square things, right, and monuments and freeways, but our actual planet is all watershed. And if you start paying attention to your watershed, you can change your world. I'm not gonna go do too much into the devastating things that are, that are happening around the planet. One thing I do wanna say, the UN uh, uh, report on disaster preparedness says that there's so many cascading factors all the time that they've given up prediction. Nobody can say what the temperature will be in 10 years. No one can say where the sea level will be. There's just too many cascading factors that are exacerbating it. I don't know, that's been my experience in life. The next year is just astounding with the horror and the, and the disaster that's happening. Who could even imagine how hot it would get on the planet this year? How many fires would be, how many floods? So um, that's a, a little bit different. I'm not going to go in very deeply because I got to keep moving. So we all owe everything to Baba, to Sri Prabhat Sankar. I can't move this box, can I? The box with all, here, here we go. Okay, you can't see that, but I can say it. So it's been a long, maybe 30 years since he said, we must capture every drop of water. We were coming to a place very soon where each drop of water is precious, you know, and that's a deep thing, a deep subject, a shocking subject. And we can say, well, it is coming very quickly. If we think the river in China, it's dead. Fishermen pull up rusted iron in the Yangtze River in China, or, or look at the, the Mekong Delta or almost any major river, they're dead. And right now in a lot of large cities in the world, um, they're trucking in water for people just to drink water, like Chennai, India. A couple of years ago, I read that there's no more available water for the population. It is all literally trucked in. So think of what kind of dangerous situation that's in. I mean, maybe some of, I've been in Indian situations where we didn't have water available and you really start suffering really soon in a hot country. But just imagine all those millions of poor people out there um, in poor regions who are suffering, dying with, without water. But Baba gave us such a wealth of information to work with. It's deeper and deeper and deeper the more we go into it. The first thing he did was, you know, he actually traveled with a companion. I can't remember what book it is, uh, around the rivers, around all the great rivers. And he talked with this young man about how changes in river flow, geography, terrain, and soil influences um, influenced language and culture and inventiveness. We know about his, his epic book, Ideal Farming Part Two. Can any, anyone who's read Ideal Farming Part Two, can you raise your hand? Fantastic, actually fantastic. Each page is such a wealth of information, right? About where to plant a pond and how to plant trees around it and how to form um, you know, fertile land. And, and it's, it's really amazing. So Baba's given us such a deep wealth and that's what my presentation is really based on. So he presented this idea of mountain, river, valley, and civilization, that civilizations forever have gone through this phase within a given watershed. Starting in the mountains, we have old growth forests, the rain flows down, we have really mineral rich soils and, and waters. And in society, that's kind of the hunter gather phase. The second phase is the river valley, where farming begins in the hilly flanks of the valley with natural ponds, wetlands, lakes, and reservoirs and grasses. And here we have a civilization I think a lot of you are familiar with, Angkor Wat in the Mekong Delta. Uh, the Mekong River actually starts in the Himalayas and curses through like seven different countries. 
before arriving in, in, in Angar Wat. And what you're seeing here is an amazing watershed um, civilization, this photo on the right. So what's happening here is you have a main, the main temple in the mid middle, and then these smaller temples actually represent the dispersal of water, how this brilliant civilization learned how to disperse water to the smaller cities and, and the villages. And they also developed reservoirs, you know, and canals. That's why it became a brilliant civilization with, with agriculture. And the same was imitated in Mayan culture and Egyptian culture. The same kind of thing was been repeated and repeated. How many are big, of our big cities around the world like that? We, can we say our water dispersal cities? It's almost like a joke, right? We waste so much water. How much rain water that falls ends up in a polluted river? Um, okay, I'm getting somewhere here. Now, like I said, I'm really for every technological change that's beneficial for the ecology, but I believe that the watershed is the measuring stick for how successful or how much a failure each invention is. Um, here, you can look at two pictures. And this is a normal picture in Japan now. It's not unusual. You have like Chinese uh, multinationals coming in and completely annihilating the, the, the mountainside and replacing it with huge arrays of so solar energy. And here, unless you can't see it, it's they're being flooded um, you know, there's a lot of flooding everywhere, flooding in Japan, and these arrays are being flooded into the city and killing people, destroying homes and killing people. And here's something I just found the other way that I, it's so ridiculous, I never believed I would see something like this. This is a solar ray that's on the, the ocean, on the sea, and a hurricane has come and, and destroyed the whole, the whole thing. So, you know, I'm going to be talking more about how we regenerate the watershed, but these are should be basic, simple understandings, right? That you don't do that. So how do you stop that? It's returning back to the watershed and the flow of the watershed. This is uh, something I came up with about a week ago that I think is very parallel. This is a story of my, my book. I have eight examples of amazing watershed civilizations and how they address climate change and ecological collapse. That's the, 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 the meat of my book are these eight different case studies. And I'm gonna take you through three of them that are amazing civilizations. And then I charted in what ways are they uh, addressing climate change and ecological resilience. So I've got this checklist you, you can look at and di different from just like one technology, all of these civilizations are addressing like seven or eight ways of rejuvenating the watershed all together at one time. And the other thing about these civilizations is they've been here for thousands of years. You know, who knows what's going to happen to solar technology in, in 10 years? How effective will it be? Windmills now are falling over. You know, when we rush towards technology, we know we make a lot of, you know, mistakes. When we focus on the thousands of year practice, we're going to have a resilient practice. So I'm going to go through the first three. Okay, I'm going to go through through two of these uh, watershed. How's my time? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, just gla gla gaze at this for for a minute or so. It's very easy to understand. On the left are the different watershed uh, civilizations in my book. Satoyama and Satumi are Japanese. Hawaiian are the Awapaha, the Mayan forest garden, Tikal, Aztec Tinapas, the Kanat and Perez. You may not have heard of any of these. That's okay. Most people don't know anything about them, but these systems have been fun, fundamental to civilizations for thousands of years. Here's the first example that everyone's in love with. It's called Satoyama and Satumi in Japan. Satoyama means forest village, and Satuvan means ocean village. So it's one continuous nurtured eco ecology from the top of the mountains and into the ocean. And they have what they call fisher forests. The fisher people, men and women from the coast, march up to the forest and plant trees because they know what they're doing huh? from the minerals that are enriched and the water that's enriched. 
they're going to have a really abundant um, marine ecology when you go to the ocean. So uh, it's a very, very inspiring. This organization behind it now has 258 examples around the world that are doing this kind of work. Um, yeah, and what does it look like? They do, I mean, when we talk about fire, a lot of people will say, well, now we've got so much raging fire, it's so awful, but all through civilization, people studied fires. They were fire experts, you know, so they knew from the top of the mountain and into the ocean what it would look like. And there's just a picture of the, okay, the Mayan forest garden, I'll skip that, all right? You have to read my book. But I do want to address the Hawaiian Awapaha, which is facing us right now with the fire in Lahaina. Am I talking okay? Am I making sense? Yes. Okay, okay. So um, traditionally in Hawaii, they had a watershed system, system called Awapaha. And it was just like the Japanese, where it was a completely cultivated society from the tips of the mountains and into the ocean. They had a taboo against swimming in the ocean because every niche in the, in the ocean was to be cultivated, whether fish life was there or seaweeds or coral, you know. Yeah, um, there'll be some time for talking when I'm done, right? And it's really, really, well, it's tragic about the fi fire in Lahaina now, but it's really easy to understand from this view of the ancient ecology in, in, in Hawaii. What happened to bring the fire ecologically was that US sugar farmers and pineapple farmers, they threw the indigenous people out, took over the land. The US army came, slaughtered a lot of indigenous people. And so what was left is the pine pineapple fields and sugar fields were no longer viable commercially. It could be made cheaper in Malaysia or somewhere else. So those fields were fallow and they ended up becoming dry weeds to attract fire. So that that's from this perspective, from the Awapaha that's been here for decades, I mean, centuries and centuries, is um, it's really urgent after this fire to return to the Awapaha system. One Margie was telling me that they're gonna have mass plantation of native trees. And immediately I said, no. But you may think, why, what's wrong with that? We need trees everywhere. But then the Wahawapaha, and let me show another slide. This is like a drawing of the Wahawapaha. And so every inch is cultivated into taro or trees or fish, ponds, all the way from the top and into the ocean. And you can see here, kind of uh, showing the different marine ecologies. So um, I think that's the way to return to a vibrant planet, a resilient planet, is to return to these indigenous ways. Okay, I'm moving on, I'm moving on. So the fire, we can see the fire along the coast. The, the Hawaiian people never lived right on the coast because um, they knew it would disturb the ecologies. So now when we're talking about housing in Awapaha, a lot of people are saying, let's build uh, uh, cheap housing for poor people. Let's make sure they have housing. That's a prop principle, right? Right? But shouldn't we listen to the native people and what they have to say about where you put houses? They would never put houses all grouped together on, on, the, on the coast. Now there's actually fights between tourists and native Hawaiians. The native Hawaiians are still fishing on those coasts. And I saw an article where a tourist was launching their fish line and the native people were cutting it so they could go fishing. So it's the capitalist agenda of the tourist industry is directly opposed to this kind of system. Now, I want you to, we've seen that focus of uh, Awa Plaha, and I want to show you what their dream is for the future. There's a really strong movement called uh, Native Hawaii. It's very strong. They bring together activists and politicians and uh, students and, and scholars and you know, um, Super Baba, we, we've got a living member of the of the Awapua here, so he, he can talk maybe later. But um, just look at this carefully. You've got a complete proud system woven into the watershed. I mean, these buildings are pretty, you know, crude, but to get the idea that you see these arrows and they point to buildings there and wind farms, so they've woven the whole proud system into the Awapua. 
right? Do you see those buildings and the, and the solar panels? So I can't see why this is different than Prow. I think it's a great leap forward in, in creating Prow. I just want to look at this again to remind people and what they've been soaking in. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine, my time is fine. Okay, so a lot of these movements are coming, becoming national sovereignty movements. It means they have their own autonomy, their own decision-making over their resources and their futures and their culture and their, and their language. It's a huge movement going across the planet. It's not small. So in Hawaii, they have the Nation of Hawaii movement and they have a minister of agriculture and this is what they do. They wanna revive the Awapaha. So it is happening in, in Hawaii that some Awapu are being, are being regenerated. New Zealand's also a very strong so Maori sovereignty movement in, in the island that has very similar to that one. South Africa also has a strong sovereignty movement. The Mai in Guatemala also have a really strong sovereignty movement. So in my book, I tried to research what is common among all these watershed systems and how are they like Prout? And this is what I've come up with. It's not literally Prout, it's Prout with these kind of things woven into it. Obviously, cosmic inheritance is something that all indigenous people have. Now, I say we owe our lives to the great creators. Baba's principle is to have a strong watershed advisory board at every level of indigenous people and experts so they work cooperatively. Revitalizing deserts and drought affected regions, obviously that's something important. You know, without even reading Prout, all these watersheds are telling you they want a decentralized watershed society. Everything I've shown you or we talk about is all decentralized. Uh, and then principle of economic democracy, the foundation of economics is no interference of resources by outside individuals or entities. Economy based on cooperatives and cooperation the three-tier economy, which is the cooperative, the um, uh, industrial, and the key industries. But, what? Individual. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and then I looked at Jamin Niyama. I said, I wanna use the, the language in my book by using language of indigenous people. You know, I don't think we should impose our language on what indigenous people are doing but i realize all of the principles that they're talking about that have booze against fishing right the cooperation that people have it's all jamanyama everything in jamanyama and so i think that's a shared ethics around the planet that everyone supports jamanyama well i've been nervous and that's taking a long time but i'm not using my book just as a book to sell but i really want to sell my whole idea was to write a book and then use it as an action tool for change around the planet the first thing I'm doing is I'm joining all the movements of my case studies. I've joined this Satoyama movement in Japan. You know, I've joined what's going on in Guatemala. So my desire is to give some, uh, offer my book to them and they'll like it. They'll like that I'm promoting their projects and then work with them all collectively, you know. And this is what's happening with native and ecology groups. People are synthesizing. People are moving together, joining together for, for a common goal. So I'm, I've been offered to write an article with the neo Humanist Review. Um, actually here in Palma, I've been working hard and failing so far to develop a watershed project here on the land over 160 acres. But now I've been told that I really have a good chance to get this grant again. So I wanna to try to be able to demonstrate with the, my own life, you know, the virtues of this system. And that we, with our example, will be shining along with all these other um, things across the planet. I think that my time is over. Do we have time for questioning? Or no? Thank you so much for listening. I felt I was stumbling a lot, but thank you.